God is powerful. God is awesome. And I love my father tonight. And I thank him for another opportunity that we can come together and we can lift up the name of Jesus in studying the word of God. Once again, this is Pastor Tammy Gibson Baptiste with Continuing Truth Ministries out of the Baker and the Baton Rouge location. And we're going to go right into the word tonight. And one of the things that many people fail to talk about is the end times. But we must talk about it because things are constantly changing. And what we must get down in our sanctified souls is we're not here to stay. We are not here to stay. This world is not our home. So as we go into the word of God tonight, we're going to be talking about Bible prophecy. Bible prophecy. One of the consistent themes of the Bible is that life as we know it is coming to an end. Life as we know it is coming to an end. Whether that end comes through death or the return of the Lord Jesus Christ, Scripture is clear that soon and very soon, our lives are about to undergo a big change. And the knowledge that the end is in sight ought to affect how we live. But do it affect how we live knowing that this world is coming to an end? What will happen to us and to the rest of the people on earth after our lives have come to an end. What does the Bible say about the future plan that God has for us? Many Christians get confused when we start talking about the end times. Yes, they do. They get confused when we start talking about the end times. The fact is, you can be very smart and still get tangled up with specifics of Bible prophecy. So as we look a little bit deeper, we're going to go into a couple of scriptures, but I want to set the tone for our teaching tonight. I hope that you have your Bibles. I hope that you have your pen and your paper ready. You may want to take some notes. Before we look at the timeline of the specific events in our future, let's consider the question. Why should we even study the subject of Bible prophecy? Why? Well, let's get to the answer. Many people think Bible prophecy is irrelevant today. They prefer to talk about subjects like how to improve your marriage, how to have a better prayer life, how I can make more money, where I'm going to build my next home or what type of car I'm going to buy. See, those things are important, but we need to know that our world around us is changing and it's coming to an end. So none of these things is really going to matter. They say those who are Christians should be studying and discussing the end times. Everybody should know about the end times. We all should know about what's going to happen to us when we leave here. Let me share three reasons it is important for Christians to understand Bible prophecy. See, the Word of God was written from Genesis to Revelation. It's a prophetic word that God is talking to His people as well as to the world because many came out of the world that are born again, saved, and set aside for the master's use and working for God like myself. Yes, I live the life of darkness. God brought me from darkness into the marvelous light. And I tell you, I would not change it for nothing. Was it easy? No, it's not an easy journey. But because I love God and I begin to read and understand what his word was saying and his word is saying today, then I decided I choose to live for God. 
Number one, prophecy is a major theme in the Bible. One way to know what is important to God is to know what subjects covered is the most in his word. And prophecy is a major theme in the Bible. Not only is it an important subject, but prophecy is a major theme in the Bible. For example, did you know that there are 1,800 references in the Bible to the second coming of Christ? See, many people don't even believe that. Many people don't believe that Christ is coming back. In the New Testament, one in every 30 verses has to do with the return of Jesus Christ. He's coming back. In fact, 23 of, 70, 23 of the 27 books of the New Testament deals with the subject of Christ's return. And in the Old Testament, for every prophecy about the first coming of the Messiah to Bethlehem, there are eight verses about the second coming of Christ. Clearly, the return of Jesus is a major theme, which is why we need to understand it. The Word of God clearly tells us that we are to get understanding. We need to understand what's at hand. We need to understand where we're going to choose, whether or not you choose where your final destiny is going to be. It's important to get understanding. We can read, but get understanding about what we're reading. Let's go here. Prophecy helps us to interpret and apply the Bible. It helps us to interpret. When you interpret something, that means you're getting a clear understanding of what God is saying. And in this particular topic that we're talking about, studying Bible prophecy also helps us to in, us interpret us to interpret and apply the Bible accurately. You can't understand the Old Testament prophet the parables and the teaching of Jesus or the epistles without understanding prophecy. Prophecy is the framework of which we hang the rest of the Bible on. Let's look at two illustrations of that. One of the Old Testament and one of the New Testament. The first example is Isaiah 65 and 20. And he said, no longer will there be in it an infant who live a few days or an old man who does not live out his days for the youth will die at the age of 100 and the one who does not reach the age of 100 will be thou a curse Isaiah was describing a time when infants don't die and people who live a hundred years. What time is Isaiah talking about? What is he talking about when he's talking this verse? He obviously wasn't talking about right now. Because even with advanced medicine, babies are still dying. A few people reach the age of a hundred. You heard what I said? Only a few people reach the age of a hundred. If you have a loved one that's in their 70s, 80s, 90s, and a few people are reaching the age of a hundred, I tell you, you need to give God glory, honor, and praise because truly it is a blessing for to, to know that people are still alive at a hundred plus years old. Was Isaiah talking about heaven when he said this? No, because Revelation 21 and 4 says there is no death in heaven. So he wasn't talking about when you get to heaven. He wasn't talking about um, the uh, future period. He was talking about, he wasn't talking about heaven. So what time was Isaiah talking about? 
He was talking about a future period called the millennium when Jesus would reign on earth for a thousand years. During that time, the curse of sin will be partially removed. Do you understand that? When Jesus come, when he come back, it says the curse of sin will be partially removed. You can't understand it without knowing Bible prophecy. The second example is Matthews 25. Verse 35 through 40. And this is what Jesus said. I want to go to this particular chapter because this is a chapter that we're going to break down. Matthews 25, 34, 34 through 40. 35 through 40. I'm sorry. And it says, For I was hungry. And you fed me. I was thirsty. And you gave me. And you and you gave me drink. I was a stranger. And you invited me into your home. I was naked. And you gave me clothing. I was sick. And you cared for me. I was in prison. And you visited me. Then these righteous ones. Will reply. Lord. Lord. When did we ever see you hungry or feed you or thirsty and gave you something to drink or a stranger and showed you hospitality or naked and gave you clothing? When did we ever see you sick or in prison to visit you? And the king, come on now, the king of kings, we talking about Jesus. And the king will say, I tell you the truth. When you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you were doing it unto me. Okay? So, let's break that down. I like the point when it says, the king will answer and say, Truly, I say unto you, to the extent that you did it to one of these, my sisters and my brothers, you did it unto the least of me. Come on now. I once heard somebody say, I am a Matthew 25 Christian. How can you say that? Well, somebody did say it and they said it like this. My faith is centered on taking care of the least of these. Okay, we're going to stop right there. You have many people that think just because they be nice or they do good gestures, that that's going to get them into heaven. We're going to stop right there. It's not going to happen. Now, we should be merciful to those in need. That is certainly the evidence of being a Christian. But is doing good things for the least of these the core of Christian faith? No. Is that what the apostles proclaimed and gave their lives for? We're talking about the apostles. Apostle Paul. Apostle, uh, the Peter, James, John. We're talking about them. They gave their life because they stood on what they were taught and what they knew. And come on now, we have to see it as it was. They saw Jesus walk this earth and what he did. He talked to them. And the Bible does not put everything into words which the Bible was written and inspired by men by, that were filled with the Holy Spirit. See, people believe just because the Bible was written by a man, that is just a book, and they don't believe. Let me tell you something. You're going to find out some more when we get a little bit further down in here because, see, God is not playing. God did not just write the 
um, inspire those men to write the word of God without having uh, consequences and blessings to go along with it. If that's the case, Jesus didn't have to come. So, no. The heart of Christianity is repentance from sin and the forgiveness of God through Jesus Christ. That is the heart of Christianity. When I came to know Jesus as my personal Lord and Savior, I had to repent. I had to turn from my wicked ways. Acts 2 and 38 says, Repent, and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus for the forgiveness of your sin. See, we got to repent and turn from our ways. If repentance and faith are the core of Christianity, then what was Jesus talking about in the book, in the gospel of Matthews? He was teaching and talking about the end times. Let's go there. When we begin to look and break down Matthews, the 25th chapter. Okay, the first part Jesus was talking about. Jesus was telling the parable of the ten bridemaids. Jesus told the following parable to clarify further what it means to be ready for his return. See, for his what? For his return. That's why Bible prophecy is so important. He was telling this prophecy to clarify what it means to be ready for his return and how to live until he come. Come on, somebody. How to live until he come. In the story of the ten bridesmaids, we are taught that every person is responsible for his or her own spiritual condition. See, we all have to stand before the judgment seat of God. So Jesus was talking about in this parable, we are to be responsible for our own spiritual condition. The story of the three servants. We're still talking about the breakdown of Matthew 25. Because see, Jesus was teaching about the end times in this particular book. And we're going to break down Matthew 25. And that's where we're going to end up at. Now, the story of the three servants showed the necessity of using well what God has entrusted to us. See, God has entrusted some things unto us. And this particular parable talking about money. Yes, money. What a lot of us don't want to get rid of. And a lot of us want to hold on to it like we're going to take it with us. But baby, we're not taking that with us. We're not taking it with us. Okay? God has entrusted us with money. And we ought to be good stewards over what God has given us. Now the parable of the sheep and the goat stressed the importance of serving others in need. See, you're going to have to go back. I want you to go back and read and study Matthew 25 for yourself. Because I'm just briefly touching the surface of what each, um, with the chapter, is the breakdown of it, what it's talking about. The parable of the sheep and the goats stress the importance. And the parable of the sheep and goat is Matthew 25, 31 through 46. And this stress the importance of serving others, others' needs. No parable by itself completely describes our preparation. Instead, it points us, each points one part of the whole picture. See, it points us to the whole picture of what God is saying. Now, the parable about the wedding 
I like that parable. It makes a whole lot of sense. The parable about the wedding, on the wedding day, the bridegroom went to the bride's house for a ceremony. Then the bride and the groom alone went with a great procession. That means people was with them. And they returned to the groom's house where a feast took place, often lasting a full week. See, they normally had a festival for a, a wedding when they were um, getting ready to get married. That festival lasted a whole week. Now, 10 of the bridesmaids were waiting to join the procession. They, in hope, they would take part in the marriage feast. They were hoping to take part in the marriage feast. So they had a hope to do it. They were ready at one point, but they got tired of waiting. Like some of us today. We don't want to continue to live holy and sanctified. We don't want to continue to trust God with everything. We don't want to continue to believe God and live holy and sanctified. When I say holy, God said without holiness, no man shall see God. We have to be pure. Only the pure in heart shall see God. We can't be straddling the fence, my sisters and brothers. We going to either serve God. Are we not? Because there's a word for those that be disobedient. And we're going to get to that in a minute. So, but when the bridegroom didn't come when they expected, five of them were out of lamp oil. They were out of oil. By the time they had purchased oil, they was too late to join the feast. They was too late. Okay. What does the oil represent? The oil represents true faith. The oil represents righteousness. And the abiding presence of the Holy Spirit. You didn't hear me. It represents true faith. Righteousness. And the abiding presence of of the Holy Spirit. When Jesus returned to take his people to heaven, we must be ready. We must be ready. I cannot emphasize that enough because God spoke to me one day while I was getting dressed and he says, no man know the day nor the hour when the Son of Man shall appear. And that's true. So in other words, it put a check in my spirit. So to keep me on the right path, because I don't want to get caught with anything, any bitterness, hatred, jealous, malice, gossip, lying. I don't want to be caught with none of that within me. That's why David said, create within me a clean heart, O Lord, and renew the right spirit within me. That's why we have to repent daily. Because we don't know what state, what time, nor day, nor hour. It could be in death or it could be when Christ returned for his church, the rapture. When he just snatched us up out of here, believers. So we must be ready. And this is what Matthew, the 20. Fifth verse is talking about. And spiritual preparation cannot be bought. See, when the when they left to go and try to buy some oil, see, you can't buy this. You cannot purchase. <laughs> Your spiritual preparation cannot be buy, bought. You can't pay for it. So you have to keep your oil, your lamp burning. And the way to keep the lamp burning and the fire going is through the word of God. Staying in his presence by the power of the Holy Spirit. Being filled with the Holy Spirit. Being baptized and emerged with the Spirit of God. That's 
I'm talking about spiritual preparation. You can't buy that. See, everybody want a deal on something. Can I get this a little bit cheaper? Can you give me a little deal on this? But see, you cannot buy your way into heaven. You cannot. You must be spiritually prepared when the bridegroom comes because he is coming. We're talking about Bible prophecy. Preparing for the coming of Christ. So what state will you be in? Are you making preparations to see Jesus, to stand before the throne of God? Glory be to God. Spiritual preparation cannot be bought or borrowed at the last minute. Come on now. You can't just jump in and have not repented and think you're going to make it. Just because you call on the name of the Lord. He got a place for you too. He going to say, depart from me, you workers of iniquity. Just because you called on the name of the Lord in a time of trouble. Oh, Lord, have mercy. But yet you're still cussing. Living any kind of way. Doing any and everything. Go sit down. Go sit down. You cannot borrow or buy Spiritual preparations at the last minute. Our relationship with God must be our own. This is an individual thing. You must have your own personal relationship with the Father. The God that created the heavens and the earth and thought enough of us to say, let us make man in our image. And he did that. And not only did he do that, but he gave man dominion and power in the earth. But we take him for granted. Glory be to God. So that's, some of the things that he was talking about in Matthew 25. Now, in Matthew 24, chapter 3, I'm sorry, 24, verse 3, the disciples asked Jesus, what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? Jesus answers this question by giving them a timeline of Bible prophecy in Matthew 25, 34, 35 through 30, 35 through 40. And that's when he went on to say, when I was hungry, you didn't feed me. This parable described acts of mercy we all can do every day. We can do these acts every day. These acts are not dependent on wealth, ability, or intelligence. They are simply acts, acts of giving and receiving. Giving and receiving. We have no excuse to neglect those who have a deep need. We have no excuse for that. We cannot hand over our responsibility to the church or the government. We cannot hand over the responsibility to the church or the, or the government to take care of people. We can't do that. We can't do it. Jesus demands our responsibility. He demands our personal involvement in caring for the needs of others. There has been much discussion about identity of brothers and sisters. Some have said that they are Jews. Others say that they are Christian. Still others say that they are suffering people everywhere. Such a debate is much like a lawyer um, answering the question when he asked, when his lawyer asked Jesus the question, he said, who is my neighbor? Let's go to that scripture. Luke. Luke 29. 
and 10. I'm sorry, Luke 29 and 29. The man, we're going to start at verse, um, let's start at verse, let's start at verse 25. One day, an expert in religious law stood up to test Jesus by asking him questions. Teacher, what should I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus replied, what does the law of Moses say? How do you read it? The man answered, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, and your strength, and your mind. And love your neighbor as yourself. 28, Jesus said, right? Jesus told him, did this, do this, and you will live. The man wanted to justify his action, so he asked Jesus, who is my neighbor? Come on now. Who is my neighbor? Our neighbors is those whom we see each and every day. Our neighbors are those who are in need and we need to help them along the way. We need to stop being selfish and be genuine in our love and our giving and caring for those that are in deep and dire need. That's what Jesus was telling him. But he wanted to get smart and flip with Jesus. But that's okay. Jesus answered the questions. Okay, we went there. Jesus was referring to in Matthew 20, 25, 35 through 40. Jesus was referring to the 144,000 Jewish witness who were saved during the tribulation period. Although those will be protected by God, they will be they will suffer imprisonment and be denied food. Jesus was saying that that future age to the extent that you minister to one of these witnesses of mine, it is a sign of your love for me. See when we do it with a pure heart and genuine, Jesus said it is a sign that it is a love for me. When you feed them, when you clothe them, when you take them in, it is as if you were doing the same thing for me. You can't understand you can't understand this teaching of Jesus if you don't understand how it fits into Bible prophecy. Prophecy is the key to interpreting and applying the Bible correctly. Prophecy motivates us toward living godly. We should want to live godly. We should want to live holy and sanctified, set apart for the master's use. Understanding Bible prophecy also motivates us to live godly. I went ahead of myself. The reason God tells us that the end time is not to satisfy our curiosity. It is to increase our obedience to him. See, the word of God as we read it and we begin to see what's expected of us, we should want to walk in obedience to God. We should want to live holy and sanctified, set apart from the world. If I, looking at what's going on in the world now, I'm glad God snatched me out. I'm so thankful that God brought me out when he brought me out. Because there's so much going on. And realizing that everything around us is going to be come to an end, it ought to motivate us to live a godly life. Because we're not here to stay. This world is not our home. In Revelation 22 and 7, he said, Behold, I am coming quickly. Blessed is he. Who heed the word of the prophecy in this book. He's talking about the word of God. When we heed something. When somebody give us instruction. Or they give us warning. We want to heed that warning. Well you know what. 
I think I'm going to take heed to what they're doing. If the Holy Spirit unction you about something, you should heed that warning. When the Spirit of God down on the inside of us as believers, when He's speaking to us, pulling us in this area of prayer, pulling us in this area of forgiveness, pulling us in the area to get rid of all that stuff that's down on the inside of us that will hinder us from standing before God, we should take heed to what God is saying. The fact that Jesus is coming back and this world is going to come to an end is a powerful incentive for us to obey God. Consistently, we must be consistent. We must be complete in what we're doing. It's not easy. But when you have the Spirit of God and you have faith and the perseverance, you persevere. We press in toward the mark. We press in toward the mark of a high call, which is in Christ Jesus. I don't know about you, but I want to see Jesus. I want to see the man that died for me. Because while I was yet a sinner, he died for me. Born into sin, shaped into iniquity, he died for me. That's why we should study Bible prophecy. That's why we should study the word of God. And many don't believe that there's a hell. But let me tell you something. Let me tell you something. I want to read. Um, I want to read uh, Matthew 25. And 41, where it talks about, um, let's, let me go, and I'm going to read this out of the King James Version, because see, some folks understand that a little bit better. It says, Matthew 25, verse 41, Then shall he say unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye curse, with everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. See, the everlasting fire was prepared for the devil and his angels. Satan's initial rebellion against God drew with him a third of the heavenly angels. And a part of these are bound in heaven right now. According to 2 Peter 2 and 4. They are bound, and according to Judge chapter 6, while the rest, see, some of them are already bound. But the rest are, the rest are free, and they exist under Satan's dominion and control. According to Ephesians 2 and 2, Revelation 12 and 7, these Free angels are his highly organized army. That's why the Bible tells us in Ephesians 6 and 7, 6, 11 through 12, that we are to put on the whole armor of God, that we can withstand what the enemy is doing, what he's going to do. Because whether we believe it or not, we feel in the effect of the demons and the angels that's causing us to want to doubt God. See, the devil comes to steal. He comes to, to rob you. He wants to steal the word of God, which is sown down on you in your heart. See, he comes to steal. The word of God tells us when God asked him where he was coming from, he said, I've been walking to and fro, up and down the earth, seeking whom I may devour. He wants to devour you. He wants to steal from you because he knew where he's going. He knew that his time is near. Now, you know, if it's Jesus going to return and we don't know when, but we must be ready. Satan know all of this too. Because he know when it really boiled down to where he is going. He know. So that's why he's coming. He's, 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 he's robbing a lot of believers. It's a lot of Christians. I mean, used to be strong and, and, and trusting God and living for God. Living holy for God. Used to. But some way. 
that deceiving, deceptive spirit has gotten into the ear and has called many to backslide. They don't have that root. They're not grounded. See, we got to be grounded and rooted in God. Don't let nothing separate you from the love of God. If God has healed your body, God has delivered you, God has done some miraculous work in your family, on your job, wherever it may be, you can't let nothing separate you, separate you from the love of God through Christ Jesus. Because see, the more I study it, the more I talk about it, the more I, 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 I pray and the more I read, I can't let nothing and nobody separate me from the love of God. It's in me. How you going to get it out me if it's grounded and rooted in me? When it comes down to my salvation with the Lord, honey, I'm going to bet with you because I know what he's done for me. I know where he's brought me from. And I fear living any kind of way because no man know the day nor the hour when the Son of Man shall appear. Good God from Zion. No man. But he is coming back. He's coming back. Like I said, the free angels are highly organized. I'm talking about the angels that that when Satan took a third of the heaven, some of those are bound, but some of them are still walking free. And if you look at some people, you can see that they are spiritually dead. They are spiritually dead. And we have some people that don't want to change and not going to change. And that's what we have to accept, whether it's in our family or not. We have to accept that some people just not going to go to heaven. As bad as we pray for them, as much as we pray for them, as much as we love them, people love living the way they're living. And it's nothing we could do to do it. Change it. But we still can pray to pray our faith. And if, it's, if, if, if they don't make it, it's not because we didn't pray for them. And we didn't offer it to them. It's because they've made a choice. Not to serve God. The free angels are highly organized. And are probably identical with the demons referred to in the Bible. We hear how Jesus cast out demons. We got people bound by so many demonic spirits even right now. We live with them. We work with them. We pass by them in the grocery store. Come on now. We know that we're dealing with demonic spirits in our families, in our homes, on our jobs. Wherever we go, they are there. They're there. Glory be to God. But as we come to a close tonight, I just want you to think about it. Bible prophecy. The world as we knew it, it's not going to go back the way it was. And I hear many say, you know, since we've had the pandemic and all of these other disasters and all these other things that's going on and that has gone on, you know, we've been dealing with wearing masks for two years and, you know, we don't know how long we're going to have to do that. But I tell you one thing, God, Jesus is coming back a second time. And if you want to know more about it, I encourage you to go to the word of God. Now that we understand Bible prophecy and the effect and understand prophecy, how we should live today, we should live with everything within us. We should live every day like it's our last day and make sure we have a repentance heart, love others. Pray for the, go see those that are sick, feed the hungry, clothe the naked. Somebody need a place to stay, you give it to them. If somebody needs something, you do it. And don't do it with an agenda. Freely you give and freely you receive. God has given us his word and he's not going to take it back. 
We have a charge to keep and a God to glorify. We have a charge to keep and a God to glorify. Don't it don't matter if folk talk about you because you they say you're spiritual holy. It don't matter if folks talk about you because they say you just in this God thing too much. It don't matter if they laugh at you. Young people, let me tell you something. It's the best thing that you can do is live holy and sanctified for the Lord while you're in your youth. It's good that God has drawn you by his spirit to come to get to know him in a very personal and uh, a loving way. I think I was in my late 30s. I've been saved since 1988. And I just made 60 years old. And it gets better and better as the day go by. It's like I can feel it down in my soul. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. And when I tell you he's good, I mean that from my sanctified soul. Because every time I read his word, every time I get into my prayer closet and I just need some time to talk with him, I just begin to tell him thank you. I thank him for saving me and making me whole. I thank him for coming into my life when he did because I was a wretch undone. Drugs, alcohol, sex, all of that stuff had me bound. I wasn't ready to die, but I wasn't fit to live in eternity. So I thank God tonight for his word. I thank God for you tuning in. I pray that it was something that was said tonight that would be a blessing to you. I pray that God continue to bless you richly. I pray that God will continue to use you to be a blessing to others. And as we get ready to close tonight, I just want to say this. We don't have time to gamble with our souls. We don't have time to waste. Because the word of God says he's coming like a thief in the night. No man know the day nor the hour that he shall appear. Now when he come, where will we be? Will we be like the ten bridesmaids? Or will we be wise? You have five that was wise and five that was foolish. You cannot borrow and you cannot buy your spiritual condition. You have to have a personal relationship with God. And I thank God for his Holy Spirit tonight. And I give God the glory, honor, and praise. So I thank you for tuning in with me. This is Pastor Tammy Gibson Baptiste with Continuing Truth Ministries, Golden Nugget Bible Study. I will be before you on this Sunday. The Lord say the same at 7 o'clock p.m. Central Standard Time.